about. All right, Bridget, take it away. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I know that um, evenings are a busy time, and that's often the time of the day when we're winding down. So um, I am really grateful that you chose to spend time with us this evening talking about birds. So feel free to get cozy. Um, like Kelly said, I encourage you to um, leave the chat open. Um, so that you can participate during this because I'm going to ask I'm going to ask you some questions too um, and ask you to drop some stuff in the chat box. Thanks for letting us know where you are from. Um, it's really wonderful to see um, folks from outside of Vermont joining us as well. Um, and it just means that our message is resonating and getting out there. So thanks very much. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. And I'll tell you a little bit about myself. So my name is Bridget Butler. I live in Northwestern Vermont. I am also known as the Bird Diva. And so you can find information about my work at my website at birddiva.com. I have been in the environmental and conservation field for oh, 25 plus years. And I've worked for all kinds of different organizations from Audubons throughout New England to small forest conservation nonprofits that work with landowners on um, connecting with birds and their land and then thinking about how to manage it in that way. Um, I've worked for an aquarium and been in the world of uh, water conservation. Um, and I'm a mom. I've got three uh, kiddos at home. They're all chowing down on dinner right now. Um, they are eight, nine, and 10. My small business, which is called Bird Diva Consulting, has me traveling all over now and doing outreach and programming around birds and bird conservation. And tonight, I'm going to share with you my new signature program. This is something that's been kind of evolving for me over the past 10 years or so and is now the focus of my work. And so that's what I'm going to share with you tonight. So like Kelly said, feel free to drop questions in the chat box at any time and we'll pick them up as we can. So slow birding, tonight we're going to talk about slow birding and and right really get down to what it is maybe some of you have heard of it before um it's a it's a term that i am using to describe the type of birding that that i um really enjoy the most um we'll talk a little bit about why you might want to try this approach to birding um, i'll talk to you a little bit about the science of how our brain works in terms of learning new things and we'll move into discussing what it's like to shift your intention away from traditional birding aspects and um, building our skills in a different way. And we'll wrap up talking a little bit about how this taught me a lot about wellness, which Kelly is actually like the first talk that I did for Nineveh was all about wellness, Kelly. And I kind of put our heads together around something that would be new and fresh. Um, and that one um, we did last year, I think. Um, so there'll be a little taste of that tonight too. So my slow birding journey evolved over a very long period of time. When I first came into the environmental education field um, out of school, I really wasn't into birding at all. And I worked as a naturalist around a bunch of different uh, nature centers all across New England. The times that I did run into birders, I didn't really like them. They were a little bit uptight. Um, they were fairly competitive and um, they were really guarded in their um, knowledge of where you could go to look for and enjoy certain types of birds, especially rarities. And so traditional birding for me really took shape when I started to work in the conservation field. And so that was very um, directed towards counting birds and identifying them, understanding if they were breeding on different lands. And I, I did really enjoy that as well, but there was something very core missing to, for me. Um, and maybe some of you have experienced this before, and maybe I've talked to some of you about this where 
I'm, I ask if you're a birder and there's always somebody that says, oh no, I don't bird. I'm not a birder, but, and then they'll go on with this story. That's like, oh, but this about birds and that about birds. And I'm like, wait, you like birds, right? You're into this. So what started happening to me was I started questioning, what is it about birding that is turning me off? Like, what do I not like? And so part of it was like the chase, always chasing rarities. Um, the competitive listing that happened, um, the bravado and ego wrapped around um, mastery of skill sets and proving that mastery to others. Um, the drive to get more birds, uh, to e-bird everything, to always finish a trail, to make sure I covered every single aspect of the trail to try to find any bird. And then the other piece of it that was really big for me is the way it was kind of over once you identified the bird, like we just kind of moved on and that was it. And so I really started to question what it was that I valued about birding. So here are some questions that maybe you can ask yourself about how you connect with birds or how you connect with nature. You could even just put nature in here. What do I value about birding was like my big question. What is my intent? What, what's my intention when I go out birding? And what is the result of that? And what I found is for me, what I really valued were these longer, deeper moments and experiences with birds that allowed me to go beyond identification and really start to notice things like behavior or the day-to-day -day, um, flow of birds on the landscape, also the connection between birds and the land and how they use the land. Um, so I'm doing this with my hands, so like vertically and horizontally, right? Depending on what type of habitat they're in. And then what was the result? And I think uh, that gets at the emotion, right? Like how do I feel when I have a good day birding? And if my intention is to go out and enjoy and connect with birds or even to connect with birds and the land, then I'm less likely to have a bad birding day. If I set my sights on finding a rare bird or getting to see the rare bird that is popped up, um, that often happens, um, and I don't find it or I don't see it or I don't see birds at all, there's this like kind of letdown, right? And when I started to change my intention about how I was choosing to connect with birds, I found more joy in that pursuit, that approach of, of connecting with nature. So here are some things that I really started to kind of flesh out as I was thinking about slowing down and connecting with birds in this different way. So these are the four things that I kind of came up with. So one was really developing a deeper skill set. And we'll talk about that a little bit tonight. What I found is when I slowed down and I kind of let go of identification as the sole purpose of being out there and connecting with birds, I really started to think about how was I looking at birds and how was I listening to birds and what was I noticing? So I was developing a deeper skill set. The other piece was a calm connection. Um, one of the, the things that I use in my slow burning practice is the sit spot method, where you sit in one place and you allow the birds to come back in around you. And so you are grounding yourself and settling yourself into this place. And it's more of a calm connection rather than being in what I call hunter mode, this pursuit mode of getting birds and adding birds to the list. The other part of it was a deeper connection to place. So when you use the sit spot method, you're going to the same spot over and over again, and you really get to know the land and the trees and the plants there and how the birds associate with that site. I've also found this when I use a slow burning approach, even when I'm walking on a trail and I'll pull up for a minute and sit down and have some space to experience the birds um, and the land in that area, it connects me deeper with that place. And the final thing that has come out of this for me is really um, uh, using it as a path to wellness. And I think a lot of us have come into 
um, connecting with nature, connecting with birds in a very different way as a result of the pandemic. And I've never really thought of myself as anyone who, um, I've never had great success in yoga class or in trying to learn how to meditate and develop a meditation practice. But through this approach to birding, I've discovered that in a way it is kind of all of those things. Um, it is a way to call you away from all of these judgmental thoughts and things and bring you into this calm connection where you can let go of some of your anxieties and stresses as well. So it's something that I have really um, enjoyed a lot. And the way that I teach it is really to get people to start thinking about these four things. Um, one is really birding where you're at. It's, it's about less pursuit and more time spent being in the moment wherever you are, whether that's in your backyard garden where you're noticing the Carolina wren that might be bopping through, or it's in the parking lot as the, as you go into the grocery store and you're watching the way the gulls are lined up on the top of the building. So really it's about taking those moments to recognize that you have an opportunity to connect to nature through the birds that you're seeing. The second piece is really, um, was really shifting for me. I feel like a lot of people kind of, um, talk down about backyard bird watchers. Um, there was this kind of distinction between whether you're a birder or you're a bird watcher and bird watchers were typically the people that were, you know, enjoying the birds that were in their garden or their feeders. And for some reason that was thought of as a, a lesser way to connect with birds than um, serious birding. And for me, what I've discovered is that the more time that we spend getting to know the usual suspects, that's what I call them. These are like our neighborhood birds, the birds we have a chance to see every day or hear every day. When we build a foundation of uh, observation and knowledge based on those birds, we carry this really strong foundation with us when we go elsewhere um, and when spring happens as well, which I'm sure some of you are already noticing, right? Things are changing on the landscape right now. You're hearing different birds. You're probably seeing some different birds as they're migrating back into the places um, where we live. For those of you from the Northern Hemisphere, sometimes we get folks from Australia and New Zealand and other places in the Southern Hemisphere here. So you might be on the flip side of things. Um, the third thing was really about grounding myself in place and really starting to connect with the land where I live and, and just developing a deeper knowledge of that. And the birds were a really great portal to doing that. And then noticing beyond species, which is my favorite part. It's kind of something that you can notice even if you don't know the name of the bird. You can notice behaviors, you can notice vocalizations, you can notice um, body language, all of that. And all of those um, types of things that you can notice just make the experience so much richer. And so that's how I approach um, my slow birding practice. And that's what I'm trying to um, connect other people with as well. I wanna give a shout out to these three women. Um, because one of the things that was really important for me was to find, well, belonging within the birding community. I wasn't really feeling like I fit in anymore because I wanted to sit in one place and I wanted to notice birds in this different way. And I, it really didn't matter to me um, about identifying or getting as many species as possible. I wanted to stay and watch behaviors. And these three women are really kind of the, the mothers of ornithology, Florence Marion Bailey, Olive Thorne Miller, and Mabel Osgood Wright. And what I love about all three of these women, um, they're very prolific writers. So you can find um, books of, um, that they have written. Florence is actually uh, the person that's credited with writing the first field guide to birds of North America, um, way before Peterson. Um, 
Olive Thorne Miller and Mabel Osgood Wright, as long as as well as Florence Miriam Bailey, were the three women who were first inducted into the American Ornithologists Union, um, and really kind of paved the way for other female scientists and ornithologists. The thing that all three of them had in common. Um, and in a way, it was forced upon them by the Victorian era where women were considered the, the homebody. Like that was their sphere of influence, was everything around and that had to do with the home. And men during that time period, their sphere of influence was considered more worldly. And our culture kept um, men and women um, to those roles very tightly. The great thing about that is all three of these women studied birds without shooting them, which was um, the method at the time. And they all watched birds in place for several hours and wrote extensive field notes on what they were observing. Florence actually said the best way of all to study birds is to select a good place and sit there quietly for several hours and see what will come and then you will get at the home life of birds. Some of their work is still cited um, in many um, different research papers. Um, a lot of the behaviors that they noticed became the core um, kind of field observations to move forward and really understand more about the whole life of birds and not just about identification. All three women were very involved in the conservation movement as well, and were um, big founders in terms of the Audubon Society as a whole. So just a shout out to them, because what happened for me is when I discovered these three women that I honestly hadn't ever heard of before, I think maybe I had heard of Florence a little bit, um, my work felt validated and what I valued about birding felt validated and I saw myself in them. And so that sense of belonging um, came back. So just like them, I've started a sit spot practice. And um, the things that I like to do are make it really close, right? So this is my backyard. This is one of my kids were really little. You can see all three of them in the picture if you look really carefully. Um, that big windowed section off the back of the house is our sunroom. And that little staircase there near where my son is standing and my daughter in the bright yellow car, um, that set of steps, that's where my sit spot is. So what I recommend to folks is really picking a place that's close by because then you have the best success of doing the second part, which is to go often, right? And I typically say, start off with like 20 minutes a day and try to go every day and sit for 20 minutes. On the really frigid cold days, I sit inside and I look out over this same viewscape um, from indoors. Um, stay as long as you like. Um, more than 20 minutes gives the birds and the rest of the wildlife in your area a little bit more of a chance to feel comfortable with you and to move back in. Things I really like to bring with me are a journal, um, a hot beverage, hot cup of tea, or maybe in the summertime, something cool. Um, and in that journal, um, I do different types of mapping. I practice different ways of note taking and noticing what I'm seeing around me. And a lot of that started with just building knowledge about my usual suspects. And so this is where I'm going to ask you to kind of start that process of your own. The first step really is getting to know who's right outside your door. So if you will, open up the chat here. And I want you to think about three birds. Like if you, when you step outside tomorrow morning, what three birds are you most likely to see or hear outside tomorrow morning? And if you don't know the names, be like that little brown bird with the, you know, the yellow dot by its nose or the mm, medium sized red bird with like Kelly said for tufted titmouse, like the little mohawk cut, right? those feathers that stand up on the top of the head. What are your three, three birds? And when I work on usual suspects with folks, we start with three and we may get to five, right? A handful is really good. Like 
a set of five birds that you can really get to know and build your foundation on is really great. And as you watch what's coming in on the chat, you're going to see some overlap, especially for those of us that are in the Northeast, even in North America. I'm really curious about our friends um, that are from Minnesota joining us tonight and um, the UK. What are your regular birds that you see? So Leslie says blue jays, eastern bluebirds, European starlings, um, Megan, black capped chickadee, downy woodpecker, house sparrow, good. Junko, nuthatch, chickadees, says Shannon. We got some really nice overlap here. McKee says blue jays, chickadee, wild turkeys. Ooh, I would love some wild turkeys in my yard. Purple and goldfinches, hairy and downy woodpeckers from Colleen. Kelly says goldfinch, chickadee, nuthatch, black capped chickadee, red and white breasted nuthatch, cool. Those are my five. There you go. Harry Downey Woodpecker. And um, Amy brings up a really great point. She says, these are my five constants year round. When we start birding and we get slow birding, especially, and we get our usual suspects, those may shift and change as we move through the seasons. And as Amy points out, you're going to have some that are like your year round friends. All right. Flora says... All birds are local to England. She's got blackbird, blue tit, wood pigeon, collared dove, great tit, black cap, and robin. Super. Tracy says house sparrow, common grackle. Good, good, good. Chickadee, goldfinches, cardinals, and bluebirds. So these are the birds that I encourage folks to start with. Really get to know these birds, spend some time watching them, developing that connection, that thread um, between you and that bird, listening to their vocalizations, maybe following them when they you know, move from one space in your yard to another. Um, oh, geez, I haven't, this is my winter slide. I don't know if I, I we're kind of in that transitional springtime. I could probably almost, no, I don't think I need to change this yet because I haven't had a lot of newcomers arrive. So I guess this, this is my set for right now. Uh, American goldfinch, morning dove, dark-eyed junco, and black-capped chickadee are, have been kind of the four core birds that have been in my yard at my sit spot um, this year. And of course, that is starting to shift and change. Um, I think I'm going to, I think I show you um, in a few minutes. If not, um, Kelly, help me remember to talk about my yard list. But I think I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to do that in just a minute. Okay, so one of the things that's really great about starting with like a core set of um, usual suspects and then following them through the year is you can kind of get to know that ebb and flow of those birds on your property. And it becomes much more obvious when those spring migrants come back or the fall migrants leave, right? So here we have, um, this is called a histogram. This is from eBird. This is for Vermont, um, kind of in my north um, western region. And the really thick bars mean when they're really tall, that means that during that particular week, the number of people that are sighting those birds in that area is there's a high frequency of that bird showing up on eBird checklists. What I love about this is it can kind of give you a visual, especially if you're a visual learner, of that seasonality of the birds in your area. So, for example, down at the bottom, you see all of the, the um, birds like the swallows and the martins are not going to arrive here. Let's see, we'll probably we get tree swallows. It says second week in March. So the first bar is empty, but the second bar is starting to pop a little bit. And so we may have tree swallows coming back soon. And at the top, you can see birds like black capped chickadee and tufted titmouse are seen throughout the year. So building that knowledge of who's coming through when can be done by keeping a list. This is the one list that I am really dedicated to now in my slow burning practice. It, we call it our backyard big year list. And my kids actually participate in it now. This photo is from 2018. So this was before they could write. <laughs> and they're all big writers now and they all contribute to the list. So the rule is you have to be standing 
in the yard somewhere and you can hear or see them or you could hear or see them from inside the house that counts too and so this is kind of the practice that really opened up my eyes to the fact that there are so many more species moving through our little downtown backyard than i had any idea about um, multiple species of warbler that i would have never have guessed um, they're not breeding there, but they are coming through. And it was all because we were setting the intention to notice birds in our yard. And a lot of times that happened from my sit spot. So we've had um, some really big years where um, we've had like uh, 73, I think is the highest number of species we've ever had in one year. Um, we average around 58. And I think we're at 93 species total for our little half acre yard in St. Albans City. It is a rural Vermont city, so it's not super city-esque, um, but it's still pretty, um, pretty surprising what shows up. All right, I'm gonna pause for a minute and see if there are any questions before we move into this next section. Shannon had to throw in there tufted titmouse. Good job, don't forget that one. That's a really good one <laughs> to have. So we're gonna move into a couple sections now where I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about skill building around this. I go into this a lot deeper in some of the courses I offer and actually, um, this April, uh, Nineveh Foundation is sponsoring a slow burning weekend at Farm and Wilderness. We'll tell you more about that at the end. But this is kind of like a teaser for skill building. What I, what I discovered in my work is that a lot of times the birding um, community and the conservation community are really intent on getting people to identify birds. Um, and so a lot of things kind of stop after that. Um, we stop noticing certain aspects of the bird once we know what it is and our brain kind of shuts off. And what we really want to do is try to stay in beginner's mind and notice things a little bit more. This will help you if you want to become the type of birder that's identifying things all the time. I have a foot in both like the traditional birding world and the slow birding world still. So what I wanted to do was really focus on enhancing our observation skills. So this is what I'd like you to do. And you can either do this with someone that's watching with you. Um, you can write it down or and or you can put it in the chat box. I want you to picture an American Robin and my our UK friend Fleur, who's on there. Um, yeah, pick your own Robin. Your Robin is in a um, whole different family of birds. Um, but you have a robin as well, so you could use that too. Um, and if and Fleur, if you know American robin, do that one. So picture an American robin, and I want you to try and describe it to someone who's never seen one before. And think about what would you say about that bird? What would you include to help that person understand what that bird is? Or who that, I should say not what, who that bird is. And feel free to type things in the chat if you like. If not, that's okay too. What would that bird look like? This is a common bird. It's a bird we see as we get into the spring and summer season here in North America. It is a very common bird all throughout North America. Um, I think most people, if you said Robin, would know what that is, both in the UK and the United States. But would we really know what to use as descriptive words about it? All right, Megan, nice job. Orange belly with brown back and yellow beak. They hop on the ground 
or will run, stop, run, stop. I love that. And they can often be seen pulling worms from the ground. Nice. We got some behaviors in there. Um, we've got a description of color, which is often the thing that we focus on first. Yes, Amy, good. Yeah, I love the behavior description too. Yay, Leslie, I love this point. Who is very different from a description? Who is cheery, prolific, ground feeders, medium, large, nice, getting it size, chunky, rounded body, mm -hmm. orangish breast, brown back, turn head to look, <gasps> ooh, 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 and another type of behavior, turning that head to look, or it almost feels like listening, right? but it's looking plump bird with a red breast. They sing early in the morning, they hop and stop on the ground. Listen, I love all these. Okay, now we're good. Now, Colleen's throwing down some numbers here. We got some inches, nine inches, has a white eye ring. Okay. Oh, this is good. great. Flora says, I'll describe a British Robin. All right, I'm gonna hold that one. She says, small, perky bird, soft, mid-brown back, this is a good one to like close your eyes and see if you can picture this bird, the British Robin. Mid brown back and side with a smooth surface, not ruffled, rusty breast, bright beady eyes, seems to make eye contact and come close to people. Cool, cool, cool. Incessant maniacal calling, I love it. All of it, good. You guys are getting, just where I want you to go much, much deeper. And I think what I love about this exercise um, is that oftentimes we don't slow down to look and to notice a lot of these things. Um, we focus on the identification to get to the knowing and the naming part, and then we kind of move on. Um, so here we have, right, we have a bird that has like dark head. It's a little bit um, grayer across the back, rusty red, right? That white that is at the bottom, right? From the belly back to the tail, the lower, lower, lower belly, right? Back to the tail, the eye ring. I did notice that somebody got that, right? Um, if this bird was facing us front on, what's really cool is they also have like white under the, um, um, what would might be the chin, the throat area and little, nice little dark um, stripes kind of through that very, very fine, right? So there's a lot more that we can tease out about this bird um, other than what is gonna clinch us the identification. And what I started thinking about really was how our brain is processing this information. So I led a lot of different bird walks. I've led hundreds and hundreds of, of bird walks and outings um, in my career. And most of the way that I was taught how to get to know birds was very left-brained. It was very um, linear, analytical. It was logical. It was reading. It was studying. It was memorizing. Um, and I, and I had to go about it in a very methodical way. What I'm discovering is that it's good to also stimulate the right side of the brain too in this learning. And how can we do a better job of that? And so the left side of the brain tends to be that more creative side of the brain, right? So here we have like whole parts, 3D shapes, right? Um, imagination, um, synthesizing, facial recognition, all of these things. And what I love is that the birding community is coming around to this. So there's a book that's been out now probably for about five years. It's called Birding by Impression. It's by Kevin T. Carlson and Dale Rosslett. What I love about this couple and they, they're married, they're a married couple. Um, she works with kids. And so kids are in that beginner's brain. They haven't lost that sense of curiosity. And so some of this um, we see in children um, right away, right? It's just a different way of, of connecting and thinking. They are, they feel, they seem to be in, in both, both sides of the brain much better than we are as adults. So what 
they discovered in their work is that both sides of the brain actually process visual information. And so that left side, again, analytical, linear thinking, logical conclusion using words and details. So this is like that book brain thinking and memorizing. But what we really need to do a better job of is getting into this non-linear, holistic, learning how to assess a 3D shape and forms that will help you basically create a visual impression in your brain that you can tap into faster than the type of information that you assemble when you think only with your left brain. Does that make, oh, I see Kelly nodding. Okay, the rest of you have your cameras off. So I wanna give you a story as an example, okay? So I'm gonna give you a picture here. So there's this one time, and this is after I had been birding for some years, um, after I became a mom, and um, my life was just crammed full of a lot of stuff. And um, yes, I just saw that chat. I'm going to grab, let me just go back a second. I'm going to grab, I, oh, I can't grab it out of my notes. Um, so I'll tell you the title again, Birding by Impression, Kevin Carlson and Dale Rosslett. Thank you, Amy, for pulling back on that. And we can probably grab it and stick it in the chat maybe. So, I was a mom. I, I I was a new mom. I had just dropped the kids off at um, child care for the day. Um, three kids under the age of three, and I was free, absolutely free. So I was driving in my car, and I had the windows down, and I had um, the radio blasting, and I was probably driving a little bit too fast on this back road. And I was coming through this um, shrub scrub habitat with some farm fields on the side, but you know, the kind of places where the small trees and things start to grow up. And there were some telephone wires that went um, over that land. And, and as I'm driving and I'm singing and I'm just loving the fact that I have a few hours to myself, out of the corner of my eye, I notice a bird on the wire and my brain says, Shrike, pull over now. So there's no way in that brief glimpse that I really had enough information to understand what I was seeing. But Northern Shrikes are kind of rare and they come to our area in Vermont in the winter time. And the very few experiences I had ever had with a Northern Shrike were exciting and invigorating and they were celebrated with other birders. This is something that I talked about in the wellness talk last year about the importance of awe and wonder and how we um, build off of awe and wonder and make it a, a, like a core memory. It's when we celebrate those things. So I had also had an opportunity to stay with and notice a shrike for a very long time with some of my first experiences with that bird. And so what had happened was, is that my right brain kicked in. My left brain couldn't translate what it was seeing in that moment. There was no way I had music going, the window was down. Um, I was driving fast, right? My, I was just dis distracted by lots of different things. But that internal deep subconscious memory of Shrike and the silhouette and the shape and the behavior of perching on a wire just, just came right to the forefront very fast. Well, I turned around and the shrike was still there. And I had another really great experience with this bird. So I, I think that's this other part of slow birding that has begun to develop for me is really thinking about spending more time engaging ourselves and allowing ourselves these moments of awe and curiosity and then celebrating them, right? Because that's what helps us kind of engage our right brain in this passion that we have for connecting with birds. So some of the ways that we traditionally do this, but I think we kind of gloss over it, is we forget to, um, 
to really focus on size and shape. Um, some of you in your descriptions, um, you were um, describing how big it was, like nine inches, right? We have three birds here on the slide. And one of the things I encourage people to do is go back to this, where we're comparing birds based on something that we know really well. And depending on where you are, right, Flora is in the UK. Um, we have another participant that's from Minnesota. This might be a different set of birds for you, but they're basically your yardsticks, right? It was as big as a sparrow. It was smaller than a sparrow. It was bigger than a robin, but not as big as a crow, right? So we can set ourselves up um, to really understand size, shape, and structure by studying silhouettes. And so this is a great practice to do when you get those everyday birds that you see all the time, is try to not look at plumage, but look at size, shape, and structure. And I'll show you a really great um, example of this. And I'm sorry, it's blurry. Sometimes um, I find things in really old books and um, I just snap photos of them because they're so good, but then the pictures don't come out great. Um, this is a silhouette plate from a very early Peterson's Guide to Birds. Um, it's on the inside cover. And in a lot of these older field guides, you will, you'll find this where you see these um, beautiful silhouette plates that are kind of a nice study in um, silhouette, silhouette size and shape. So this is what I call the blackbird slide because these are all birds that are black in color, but they all have very different sizes, shapes, and silhouettes. So I think, and I even think um, participants from, that are not from North America might be able to throw down some names here. So in the chat box, if you wanna give it a shot and put the number of the bird and then what you think it might be. You know, when you notice these birds, you're noticing different tail shapes. I'm noticing different beak shapes and lengths in relation to the head, right? The tail length in relation to the body. The tail shape, right, is very, very different. Um, one of the ways that I got really good at telling starlings and grackles apart was by walking my kids to the bus stop every morning without my binoculars. Um, sometimes I even forgot my glasses and then I really had to go off of just shape and silhouette. All right, Leslie says, number four is a starling. Nice job, good. Uh, European starling, those are in the UK too. Short tail, right? Look at the beak length in relation to the width of the head. Um, number three is a grackle. Awesome, right? I can't wait for the grackles to come back into my yard so I can really start focusing again on noticing the difference between the two. I think what changed it for me was oh, that tail. So I could get quick glimpses of a dark, almost black bird. And just from the tail, be able to tell whether it was a starling or a grackle. Um, Amy says, I put five as the cowbird. Nice. And six is the red winged blackbird. High five. There you go. Good stuff. So, in slowing down, like I encourage you, play with these birds that you have a chance to have an experience with every day and shift your intention from identification to knowing shape and silhouette. I had a lot of fun with finches at my feeder this year. We had um, red poles and siskins finally showed up, but I consistently had purple house and um, goldfinch. And so it was really great to get to know that family of birds just by studying the silhouettes and the size and the shape. Great, good, good, good. I need to find one of these to help with finches at a distance. Yes, and I think um, that's probably pretty challenging. I think even studying them close up at the feeder um, is just, it's just fascinating. So slow down and really, um, kind of tease out some of these things a little bit more. All right, good stuff. We're going to talk um, quickly about listening because the listening is like a whole, hopefully next year, my course will be pulled together on, on deeper listening. You know, 
living, being in your senses when you're in nature connects you on a deeper level. And birds are a really great great at pulling us out of that everyday gerbil wheel that is spinning in our brains. And one of the ways that they do this is through their vocalizations. So really um, enhancing our listening skills is another piece that I think, right, when we're, we're trying to um, listen in order to identify, it becomes really hard and overwhelming. And I think one of the reasons that is it's because we're not thinking about all the layers involved in listening and how to kind of train ourselves to listen on um, a different level. So the first thing that I really discovered in the slow birding practice was thinking about there is a cacophony of sound, especially as we move into the spring and the summer season, right? It's not just the nice little snippets that we get on Merlin or whatever little app we're using. There's a whole soundscape there. So really learning about a soundscape of place that is related to the habitat that you're in. Um, trying to listen to all sounds without judgment, right? So in my backyard at my sit spot, I could get really frustrated and be like, it's not even worth going out here because I can hear Route 89 and I'm in the city and there's the, the cop cars and the trains. We're in rail, we're also called Rail City. So there's the trains. But what I've done is I've learned to listen to those without judgment. They are part of the soundscape. And I've also learned to push some of those in and out so that I can listen in this layered fashion and choose which sounds I am going to focus on more. It takes a little bit of time to do, but once you develop that skill, then it becomes easier to listen to the whole soundscape and pick things out that you want to pull into the foreground of your intention, attention, not intention, but attention. The other piece is describing sounds. We don't have a lot of really good words for doing that. And I think what's starting to happen again in the bird world, we're starting the birding world, traditional birding world, we're starting to catch up. Okay, so here's another book title for you. It's called The Peterson's Field Guide to Bird Sounds of Eastern North America by Nathan Pie Plow. Pie, apple pie, plow is in snow plow. Nathan has done an amazing job of starting to give us language to describe what we're hearing. Things like whistled. If you can do that. Then maybe the sound that you're hearing is a whistled sound. I think of um, like the, uh, the tufted tit mice that are out right now. That are doing that. That's a whistled sound. Hoot coos. Of the morning dove, right? Ticking, um, words like burry. Burry would be kind of like a, a gruff sound, buzzy, bzz, or a trill that you can do. Um, nasal, I think of nut hatches for that. And polyphonic, where there are layered sounds that are together. If we think about birds in our thrush family, um, that's a really good polyphonic one. Um, polyphonic and distorted might also be like the wrens that are in this picture. So the other final piece of this in pulling apart how we can learn how to listen better is really interpreting the context of the sound. So that means not only paying attention to what the vocalization is and trying to describe it, but then zooming out and understanding what the context might be for that type of vocalization. Today, um, at the end of the day, um, near our feeders, we had a uh, um, American goldfinch, or not American goldfinch, sorry, Northern Cardinal come in, and it was just doing very sharp, quick chip notes. And its tail was flecking like this, just really quick. And what happened was, is the female came in and it was almost as if he was trying to contact her to say, it's the end of the day, let's get our last feed in before we go and take cover. So 
starting to interpret the context for these vocalizations too can be really super rewarding other than identification. Because a lot of times these sounds lead to this next part, which is like my favorite part of all, which is noticing behaviors. So this is another great skill builder. It's really about slowing down and being in this one place with a bird long enough to notice what's happening and what the body language of the bird is saying. It's about asking questions. It's about wondering. I wonder why that bird is doing that. I wonder what's going on with this bird in the picture. Well, we, we kind of know because it's a bird bath, right? But preening and bathing is a big part of a bird's daily maintenance routine. And what are they like when they're preening and bathing? Um, I find it to be one of the most soothing behaviors to watch in birds is that whole process of splashing water up over the back and then perching and, and preening through all of the feathers and shaking the water off again um, is absolutely delightful. But I think the thing that we have to do first in order to do that is to really slow down. You can't notice behaviors like this one unless you're going to stay in one place for a little bit. So one of my favorite um, experiences with bird behavior was with a friend of mine that I was mentoring who was in the AmeriCorps program at UVM. She and I went to this place called Colchester Pond that's um, a birding hotspot, really well known. And we saw these, these are cowbirds, right? We can see a little bit of the similarity in the silhouette from those previous slides. And the one on the left is the female and the one on the right is the male. And this isn't a picture from our experience, but it's the only one that I could find that even had a snippet of what we saw. So we saw one female and four males, and the males would go through this routine of stretching way up as high as they could with their neck and then leaning over almost as if they were going to fall off the branch and doing this pose in front of the female. And they each did it in turn. And then she flew off with one of them and the other three sat there for a minute and then they flew off in another direction. And it turns out this was a whole set of mating displays that were being done by the males in this group to impress the female. We didn't know that at the time. I mean, we had a guess and we went back and researched it afterwards, but we would have never have seen that if we had just said one, two, three, four cowbirds and now we're gonna move on and go get the next bird. So we really did slow down and stay in that one place to notice these behaviors. And I'll tell you, I have seen I just, just amazing moments with different birds because I am allowing myself that time, um, setting that intention to notice and be with the birds a bit longer so I can get a feel for them. And finally, as we wrap up our time together, I want to share this one other really core piece that started to come into my birding practice after I started using the sit spot method. And for me, really, it was I want to learn bird behavior. And then all this other stuff started happening. And it's taken me in this totally different direction. Um, my birding practice really started to benefit me. I struggled with the dispatch, like being told how to bird and feeling like the way that I was birding wasn't valuable anymore. I worried about where, how I would be perceived in the birding community. Um, having three kids changed my ability to have the time to go and chase and show up on all these different bird walks and, and all of that. And I really started to, to think about Right. Like what do I, again, it goes back to some of those first slides. What do I really value? What do I really want to get out of this? And the first time that I sat on a sit spot um, without any other worries was for 45 minutes. And it was at a course um, on bird language. And as I came off the sit spot, um, I broke down and I started crying. And I realized that it was the first time. I had really given myself permission to be in nature and be with the birds without 
any other, anything else coming into play. It was just about noticing. I didn't have to worry about kids. I didn't have to be a scientist. I didn't have to get data. I didn't have to add to my life list. I didn't have to do any of those things. And it was an overwhelming, like just a release, a huge release. And it tied right into mindfulness practice. So Claire Thompson here, and this slide has the book on it. There you go. So Claire Thompson is, um, she's actually from the UK. She does a bunch of workshops over, um, over there. She's written this book called The Art of Mindful Bird Watching. She says, mindfulness is paying attention on purpose. There's that intention part without judging, right? With kind acceptance to our thoughts, feelings, bodily sensations, and the surrounding environment. So now for me, this practice has become a, a, a path to wellness for me as well, right? It's, it's increasing my concentration. It's making me feel connected. Um, it's reducing my stress uh, and my anxiety. Um, I've learned to breathe a little bit deeper and drop my shoulders um, when I'm out experiencing and enjoying birds. And so now what I want to be able to do is really turn other people on to this way of birding, that it is okay. What, however you want to connect with birds is the right thing. And there's all these different benefits to it, um, rather other than just knowing a lot of different kinds of birds. Here's one of my favorite quotes that really made me feel like, yeah, I'm on the right path and I'm doing something that um, it's just, uh, just really joyful and is giving something back to me and helping me a great deal. Wendell Berry says, the faster one goes, the more strain there is on the senses, the more they fail to take in the more confusion they must tolerate or gloss over, and the longer it takes to bring the mind to a, to a stop in the presence of anything. So I would like to encourage all of you to allow the birds in your life to pull you out of that busy place and for you to give yourself the gift of getting to know them on a deeper level and develop your own slow burning practice this year. And with that, I'll let you know how to get in touch with me. You can find me at birddiva.com. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. I teach slow birding classes. Um, I'm, we just started a five-week course in how to connect with birds in this way. It's, um, it's, a, it's a group class. We have discussions, um, videos, all kinds of things like that. And like I told you in the teaser a little bit earlier, uh, the Nineveh Foundation is sponsoring a slow burning weekend with me, April 22nd through the 24th at um, Farm and Wilderness in Plymouth, Vermont. Kelly just dropped a link in the chat so you can grab that and learn more about the weekend and how you can register. And of course, you can find other opportunities on my website as well. Um, for those of you who like birding festivals, I'll be at the Catskills Birding Festival um, this year in May and the Boreal Bird Festival in June in the Adirondacks. And fingers crossed, you guys, hopefully today um, I may be heading to the Acadia Birding Festival in Maine in June as well. Um, so bringing all of this together. Please feel free to reach out anytime. And I'm happy to take questions right now. I'll stop sharing my screen if I can find the thing that says stop sharing the screen. Where'd it go? There it is. All right. Yeah. Thanks so much, Bridget. It's always a pleasure to have you come and talk um, about so many different skills, your experience. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I learn something uh, every time. And I think we're a small enough group uh, and I recognize we're a little past eight, so if people have to go, they go. But um, for a small enough group, if you have questions, I think you can just come off mute and, and go ahead and ask them. Or if you'd rather put them in the chat, I'll keep an eye on there. Um, but 
Um, thanks again, Bridget. But yeah, questions. Yeah, you thank you all. Oh, I see somebody who's been at Doe Camp. Hi, Colleen. It's good to hear from you. Yes. Oh, Doe Camp back in the day. Whole bunch of women that used to get together for a weekend of outdoor recreation and crafting and all kinds of good stuff like that. Good to see you. Oh, Amy says, I feel like I've been developing a sit spot practice this winter in my armchair overlooking the feeders. Will now promise myself to continue outside once it's warm enough and before the black flies. You, one of the best ways that I kind of extend that a little bit, um, once all of the weather proofing comes off my windows, when it is still chilly or yucky out, crack the window open a little bit. Then you get the sound and you get the smells of the outdoors. And so that is this other way to engage your right brain is really being in all of your senses as well. So that's another way to kind of enhance your indoor sit spot. Yeah. Shan says, honestly, I love the permission. Yeah, do nothing. Sometimes I just draw. Sometimes when the birds aren't there, I sit and wonder and just jot down lots of questions about wondering about where they are and what they do when the weather is yucky or even when it's really super nice. Where is everybody? That kind of thing. Good. Go sit outside for long periods of time. It's good for you. <laughs> awesome. Amy says, here's another one. Onbound. Oh, bird therapy. Is that the one by um, Joel Harkin, right? Or Harkness. I can't remember his last name. Um, yes. And there's another Harkness. There we go. Really good book. Uh, there's another one that just came out um, by a friend and colleague. Her name's Holly Merker. Put, I don't have a link, but I'm going to put this one. So it's called Ornitherapy. And I don't want to just send it to Kelly. I'll send it to everyone. Um, by yeah, Holly. Holly Merker. You're like, I'll take it. Yeah. Um, I do have a question. Since uh, Amy uh, brought up Black Fives, do you... Yeah, with the, your sit spot and and other things like um, how do you how do you work with that when it's uh, bug season? Yeah, um, find a place that's not so buggy. <laughs> <laughs> um, two, right? Like good good equipment, good um, gear, right? Um, I bought myself like really nice, rain, like nice rain pants, invested in a good pair of rain pants, a good rain jacket. Um, one of those, um, really funky looking hats that have the, like the mosquito netting around it. Um, and there, or don't, or don't sit on a day that it's too buggy. It's okay to skip a day. Give yourself permission to do that too in developing your practice. But I think good gear can really help. Um, I've had some bird sits in the pouring rain when I was um, doing some training with folks with um, in the bird language realm. Um, and I was amazed at what I saw even in the pouring rain. So if you're prepared, great. If, you know, if not, don't, yeah, don't do that. Don't, don't try it. During the winter, um, I now have a small um, collapsible uh, seat and it's literally stands about that big and it's about that big around and I can jam it down in my backpack. So I have a very small backpack. So that goes in it. Um, I have a small fleece blanket that rolls up really nice that sits in next to it. And then I can fit my field journal and my um, bird guide, um, my Sibley's guide in there if I want it. And then on the outside, I have a big thermos with a hot cup of tea. Peppermint and ginger are my favorite two teas to bring out in the woods with me. Um, and and so then I have the gear that I need. So I'm not sitting directly on the ground. I can cover myself up with a blanket 
to provide that extra layer. Um, that's how I've been enjoying like winter sit spots on the go this year, which has been really fun. And then giving myself permission to um, do the sit spot inside with a cup of tea um, is great in the winter as well. For sure, yeah. Amy, you have a question. Kind of a question, kind of a, will you riff on this? I, when we moved to Canada, I got very into eBird. The, the birders here are very, very welcoming. In fact, even though I wasn't chasing everything, which was lovely, they were very helpful mm. in the field. So that was nice. Um, but that isn't for me, more from an environmental point of view than an, I don't like chasing and running, you know, being in the car that long. Mm. And, and the disappointing days, et cetera, and seeing the bird that's probably not going to survive more than five days because it's out of place in winter, et cetera, et cetera, because I'm a big softie. Um, but I do still like listing an eBird and written lists from a outsourcing my memory point of view, I think, mm. being able to look back, knowing that uh, we have Scarlet Tanager Day here and they turn up here within about, two days either way every year that kind of thing so yeah. I got back into eBird more I kind of resent rejected it all and ran away and now I've come back into it just from us seeing how things are in my little area um, yeah and patch but patch birding I think patch birding is I don't hear that over yeah here much, but, um do you still list or have you kind of I know you keep the the indoor list which I love mm. but do you still kind of list just for your own interest or is, have you dropped that off completely? Yeah, you know, and I've, this is really hard because a majority of my professional work has been in the conservation field. So gathering data, right, is, is really important in, you know, making some of these management decisions in different places. And eBird serves a great purpose to the, you know, broader knowledge of the scientific community. And so there have there are times when I feel guilty that I'm not going to do a list. But I think it's okay to give yourself permission to do that because I feel like you experience the birds in a very different way when you're not keeping a list. What I will do, um, and I'm looking up because this is where my like field journal is right now. It's not in my bag. Um, but there are a number of ways that I'll do this so that I can, one, let go of um, what some people call like the monkey brain. I call it gerbil wheeling. But that that need and that desire to tick off all the birds that you're hearing or seeing. So in my journal, what I do, and I got to remember how to slide this the other way. Well, give me a second. Yeah. So across the top is where I put like my metadata and then you see down the edge and that's not the right side of the book, Bridget, go over here. And you see down the edge here, these are all my little four letter codes um, for different birds. And so that just becomes a kind of the place where I can let that left side of my brain get rid of all of those birds, right? Like just, I'm just gonna list them really quick so that I can focus on other things. And then the rest of my journal, all of, all of this in here are all the things that I'm noticing and wondering about and you know, making observations about. And that way I can satisfy that left side of my brain and then engage um, a little bit more in a more balanced way. Um, so yeah, it is a push pull, but it's like, it's that intention. Like, what do I wanna get? out of this moment. And, and once I discovered using that word in birding intention, what's my intention today with birding? Um, it gave me a lot of freedom to pick and choose what I wanted to do. Today is a day when I want to go and list and I want to make sure I keep an eBird list for whatever reason that is. Um, and, and today is not, and I still, oh, I still get uncomfortable because I'm like, you should be eBirding. You should do that. Um, but sometimes it's about other things. And I find I bird in a different way when I let go of that. Oh my gosh, right? Let go of being on this tick, 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 right? Because that's the other thing that happens is then you, oh, I'm just going to check Twitter for a minute or I'm just going to check that for a minute. And then I'm not present. I'm not present in what I want to be doing. Yeah. Great question.
every time I burn, okay, so I'm, I'm like looking, I just gave myself the okay not to e-burn in that moment and just watch and enjoy them and put them in my journal. Yeah, Kelly, project feeder watch, Christmas bird count, but every time I bird, no way. Um, Fleur says, it's so great that you've showed what you do, including your lovely 2018 big year list. Yes, thank you. Thanks for coming. I really appreciate the time difference must be really big there yeah. right now. <laughs> so you're sticking with us. Super. Yeah. Well, I think we'll um, wrap things up, but you have um, Bridget's, um, I put um, Bridget's uh, website in there. You have her contact information. I'm just dropping my contact information in the chat if anybody has any questions for me. Um, and I'll just put one last plug in, um, you know, these um, nonprofit organizations where um, we're sponsoring these types of programming, we hope to do more of this type of programming for free in the future, whether it's virtual or in person, that's really important to us. So um, if you have the means and you'd like to drop a little donation to uh, Nineveh Foundation to support future programming like this, we'd really appreciate it. Um, we can't do this with, unless we have um, folks who want to donate and support um the programming um and it really helps us like bring in people like bridget to, to bring mm -hmm. this kind of information to the our community so we really appreciate it appreciate you all being here it's so nice to meet new people and to hear from you it's been a lovely evening thank you bridget um and we hope Thanks, all of Kelly. you will stay connected to both bridget and um our organizations as well so no matter where you are so um Great. thanks again very much and uh yeah, reach out if you have questions. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. <laughs>